This episode contains references to war and everything that goes with it. Listener discretion is advised. Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 117. It's how you use it. This podcast is recorded in Te Whanganui Atara, on the rohe of Muaupoko, Taranaki Whanui, Te Atiawa and Ngāti Toa Rangatira. We are generously supported by our amazing patrons, like Alison and Camilla. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we started talking about Māori weapons, beginning with the shortest, like patu, and moving towards the longer ones, like taiaha. Today, we will talk about some more weapons that are similar to taiaha, but had their own unique characteristics. The pōwhenua is probably the simplest of the three long weapons, especially since it wasn't generally carved or decorated as much as the taiaha, but the two are very similar, with a pointy end and a bashing end. The only bit of carving the pōwhenua has is a small carved band about 40 centimetres from the tip, called the whakawhiti, there were some pōwhenua that were extensively carved, but these seem to have been for ceremonial purposes, or for trade with Europeans, rather than for combat. Although the two weapons occupy the same niche, they do have a number of practical differences, such as the taiaha has a more broad spear tip that is quite flat, whereas the pōwhenua is more pointed, like a pencil. The other end, with the club-like shape, is also more flared out on the pōwhenua, overall making it look more like a paddle. Again, like the taiaha, the two ends of the pōwhenua were used to crush and stab. The idea being that the tip, which would be hardened in a fire, would be thrust into an enemy to finish them off after they had been struck with the club end. The club of the pōwhenua could be used to target pretty much any part of the body, but commonly the head, shoulders, torso and legs, with the pole being designed to slide a bit in the hand to allow for the best strike. Given their similarity, both the pōwhenua and taiaha are made in the same way, or very close to it. To start, a long, single piece of timber would be cut down to the roughly correct diameter with a toki, adds. Much like sanding, this would start with larger, heavier toki doing the bulk of the work, and then move on to smaller ones as the desired size and shape was gradually reached. Sandstone, or pumice, would then be rubbed on the wood to sand it down and make it smooth or at least as smooth as possible, since this would leave a rippling pattern. The weapon would then be finished by rubbing the trunk of a fern on it, to give it a kind of glossy, polished look. Occasionally, weapons made from timber would be oiled, either with shark oil, or if it was particularly special, human fat. At some point during this process, the pointed tip would be put into a fire to harden it and make it more durable. But while a pōwhenua wasn't being used, they were often left in the rafters of a whare, so the smoke from the fire in the house could continue to harden the whole weapon. The third weapon in the long category is less famous than taiaha, but is still quite well known, and has an even bigger reputation of being a chiefly weapon. Tefa tefa are long-handled staffs with a broad axe-like head at the top. Just like the other two long weapons, these are made from a single piece of wood, usually rata or manuka trees. But in Te Uruweta, there are some examples made of maire. The pole of the tefa tefa was usually oval shaped and had a raised carved bit about 40 centimetres from the end, just like the pofenua. 
the carving usually depicted a couple of heads, and may have had the practical purpose of stopping the hand from slipping too far down the shaft when it became wet. In terms of length, Tefa Tefa were on the shorter end of the long weapons, at about 1.1 metres. They could be even shorter, but these were probably used for ceremonial purposes. Naturally, the most visually striking part of the Tefa Tefa is the axe head, which has a large, flat surface which was great to have some carving. Upon first glance, you might think that this axe part is what did the damage, that the Tefa Tefa is a chopping weapon. But on closer inspection, you will see that the axe is blunt. And in fact, this part didn't make contact with the enemy at all, well, assuming it was used correctly. The back of the axe head is what was used to strike an opponent, the axe itself acting to add more force of weight to the blow, rather than doing damage of its own accord. At the bottom of the axe, a hole would be drilled to allow a cord to be put through where some feathers would be tied, usually kiriru or kahu, which swished around in front of the enemy's face and would distract them. From there, the toa could quickly poke them with the pointed end of the tefa tefa, smack them with the back of the axe, preferably in the head, and then stab them again to finish them off. As mentioned before, tefa tefa are considered to be very chiefly weapons, sometimes being called rako rangatira, which is the literal translation. They were a pretty common sight wielded by rangatira on the marae in Faikorero or used to mark time for those paddling in a wakatoa. Probably the most unique use of the tefa tefa though was to signal troops during battle, to attack, retreat, and so on. Since it was a unique looking weapon, especially with the feathers dangling off of it, so it could stand out and be easily seen in the chaos of battle, especially if it was raised over the head, making it great for signalling. The tefa tefa wasn't as common as taiaha or patu, given it was really only for chiefs, but since it was kinda interesting to look at and unusual, collectors acquired lots of examples, so they are actually really well represented in collections around the world. Ones still with the feathers are particularly sought after. The last thing I want to say about all three of the long weapons, Taiaha, Pofenua, and Tefa Tefa, is that hopefully you have picked up that all of these were wielded in a similar fashion. Held along the shaft and struck with a series of quick thrusts, strikes, or parries. Using feints with one end of the weapon only to strike with the other was a common tactic. All of these weapons, if wielded with sufficient force, could kill in a single blow. The weapons we have talked about previously were all mostly used by chiefs and nobles. They were well decorated, with carvings or feathers, and particularly significant ones that were wielded by important people might be named or passed down through the generations. The weapons we will talk about for the rest of the episode, the extra long weapons, aren't chiefly, aren't decorated, and weren't passed down. They were easy to use, quick to make, and often disposable. They were the weapons wielded by the masses. Weapons of the people. If you know anything about pre-gunpowder warfare basically anywhere in the world, then you can likely guess what form these extra long weapons took. Spears. They're quick to make and take very little skill to use. So whether it be fjords or towa, long pointy sticks were great to equip your less skilled troops. So Māori weren't particularly unique in figuring this out, but the interesting stuff is in the detail of how Māori designed their spears to make them just that extra bit deadly resulting in a number of types for both thrusting and throwing. 
Unfortunately, they're a bit hard to group, because different iwi have different names for the same design of spear, and some iwi will just use the same name for different spears. But we're going to do our best and talk about the ones that come up most commonly in the literature. Huata were the longest spear Māori had, at about 5 to 7.5 metres long, with a pointed tip and sometimes a rounded butt. It was also pretty thin, being 2.5 centimetres in diameter at its widest. They were usually made from tawa or rimu, preferably a tree that was tall and mature, since they split more easily. Toki would be used to get the wood to the desired size, before removing any bumps by scraping a sharp stone or shell along it. The spear would be finished off with sandstone to smooth it out, and sometimes the underside of a fern. The point could be hardened by fire, and shark oil rubbed all along it to give a nice finish and prevent splitting. Sometimes it was decorated with kuri fur as well, which was tied to the shaft just above the butt. The idea behind huata, as described by missionary William Colenso, was quote, used in defending their forts and stockades, being thrust through the palisades at close quarters against the legs and bodies of the invaders, end quote. Palisades in pa, hill forts, were generally held together with horizontal posts, so the huata would be leaned on top of those as it was thrust out against the enemy. Huata could also be used to attack pa, though it was much more rare and generally didn't involve using the spears in a conventional fashion. One example of this is of Tuhoi attacking a pa by tying bundles of ferns to their huata and setting them alight, attempting to burn the walls and buildings within. With everything on fire and smoke filling the pa, the defenders fled and Tuhoi captured the fort. When not in use, much like other weapons, huata were kept in a specially built armoury, or in the rafters of a whare. Tokotoko were basically shorter huata at about 3 to 3.5 three metres long, meaning it could be used in close quarters combat. We don't actually know a lot about tokotoko, as not much is mentioned by European writers, and a lot of the info has been lost. While huata were the longest spears Māori had, tau were the most common. It was pretty similar to a huata with a blunt butt and fire-hardened tip, being around 2.1 to 2.7 metres long, getting a bit thicker at the blunt end. It was usually made of manuka, maire, rimu, hino, or other woods, depending on what was available. The shaft could have some carving, but this was rare. Overall, it was pretty simple, and sometimes mass-produced, but... That isn't to say it wasn't lethal in the right hands, and it was actually often the weapon of choice when someone decided to go out and seek utu. Most likely, the tau was the quintessential everyman or peasant's weapon, since it was easy to make, made from easy to access materials, and simple to use. Again, on the flip side, Taiaha, patu, etc. were often highly decorated, meaning they took longer to make, were difficult to manufacture, were made from high-value materials, and took a fair amount of training to use correctly. Hence why they were used by the Māori version of the aristocracy. As part of that though, since the fancy chiefs didn't use them that much, we don't know a lot about tau. One of the few stories about Tao comes after European arrival, where an elder would often demonstrate to the rangatahi how to use one. However, according to the European writer, the kids only afforded him the time of day out of respect, rather than genuine interest in how to use the weapon, as muskets had already become the favoured armament. Koi koi were roughly the same size, about two, two and a half metres in length, 
their main point of difference to the other spears was that they had both ends pointed rather than only one. They were very common in pre-European Aotearoa, but we don't have many examples today. Probably because it wasn't exciting to look at like the more carved weapons. Titama were also about the same length as the tau and koikoi, but seems to have been used for throwing as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat. Whether it was thrown or held onto and thrust seems to have differed between iwi. You may recall a story that we talked about a while ago from Nati Kahununu, who were defending their pa against a Waikato iwi. A champion stepped forth and offered to throw his spear at a man behind the Waikato chief to try show his prowess, but instead threw it at the chief himself and killed him. Well, the weapon the champion used there was a titama. This sort of thing was fairly common, with the titama being used a lot in meeting Manuhiri, throwing a spear to land in front of them to show battle prowess and dissuade any funny business. This occurred a number of times when Europeans arrived, which resulted in the newcomers firing on Māori, since they didn't understand what was going on. Tete are some of the more, shall we say, quote-unquote, fun spears. They were mostly used for thrusting, but sometimes throwing as well, being constructed in roughly the same way as the other spears. The point of difference that the tete brought was the, well, it was, it was the actual point of the spear. You see, it has a grooved notch at the front, into which a detachable point could be set. This point, called a matarere, was usually made of a hardwood, whale bone, human bone, or the barb of a stingray, and was held in place by a small cord wrapped around it. Some tete did have small amounts of carving on them, but more often, if someone wanted to jazz up the spear, they had tufts of kuri fur tied on. As you might expect, the idea of the detachable point was to get it to release and be stuck in the victim, making it difficult to remove, do more damage if it was removed, and maybe cause it to get infected. Stingray barbs were great for this, because they are naturally counter serrated. Basically, they have lots of tiny sharp points facing in the opposite direction to the main point of the barb, meaning if it was pulled out, then it would cut even more into the already open wound. These weapons are nasty, designed to inflict a horrific amount of damage. But they weren't what Māori feared most on the battlefield. That honour belonged to the absolutely fucking brutal Tarerea. Every single weapon we have talked about, and even the couple more we still haven't, don't even compare to Tarerea. They were still spears, varying in length, but they were about three metres on average. The idea was similar to the Tete, that of a detachable point, Except the point was barbed, meaning unlike even the most terrifying stingray barb, which is still sort of evolved to allow removal, these were designed to stay in the wound, except at great cost. Additionally, it wasn't explicitly detachable, in the sense that the tete point was separate to the rest of the pole and wrapped with a cord. The point of the tete is clearly designed to be left behind whilst keeping the rest of the spear intact. The tere barb was actually part of the whole weapon and just kind of designed to break off upon being stabbed into someone, resulting in a jagged piece of wood that was terribly difficult to remove which could cause more damage and possibly infection. To me, this reads like a tereere was a one-time use item, whereas a tete was multiple use, 
especially since Tete also had carving on them sometimes, indicating more investment in the weapon. Some accounts mention the tarere was thrown as well, as was the case when it was used against Marion Dufresne and his men in 1772, which caused a few of them to get quite severely injured. James Cook even said that, quote, they handle all their arms with great agility, particularly their long pikes or lances, against which we have no weapon that is an equal match except a loaded musket, end quote. John Rutherford, sometimes known as the White Chief for being a Pākehā Māori, saw a barb being removed from someone's thigh, which involved cutting it out with a shell leaving a sizeable gash. If the spear missed, it could be thrown back at the enemy, and in one case that Elston Best saw, a man was killed by his own spear that was thrown back. Right, to finish up, let's talk about some long weapons that sit a little outside the standard categories of short, long, and extra long. There's always exceptions to every rule, and nothing fits neatly into boxes. The hoeroa is probably the most unusual Māori weapon when compared to the others. We actually still don't really know what it was used for, or how it was used, And, in fact, there is some debate about whether it was a weapon at all. Some scholars suggest it's perhaps a staff used to show chiefly authority, though that is now a minority view. It was made from the jaw of a sperm whale, and measured about 1.5 to 1.8 metres long, and was about 5 to 8 centimetres in width. Due to the nature of the jaw it was made from, the hoeroa had a slight concave curve to it. Carving was usually on the butt, however the hoeroa was quite flat, so there could be some carving along the surface too. Additionally, they were occasionally adorned with hawk feathers or kuri fur on special occasions. Again, we aren't really sure how it was used, Some say it was purely for striking, whereas others say that it was used for parrying and other movements in a similar way to a taiaha. Alternatively, a hypothesis supported by Te Rangihiroa was that the hoeroa was used at range by throwing it underarm at a fleeing enemy and then retrieved by pulling on a cord. The kōpere was a dart, and in its most minimalist form was just a sharpened manuka stick. They were usually about 60 to 90 centimetres long, though there are some, mostly from Tuhoi, that were nearly 3 metres long. The dart would be propelled by a kōtaha, which was a stick with a cord on it, which the kōpere would be tied to and whipped around to throw it at the enemy. Kotaha sometimes had elaborate carvings of heads at their base, inlaid with pawa. Kopiri and Kotaha are pretty much the only examples of ranged weapons used by Māori, so there is some doubt whether they were around prior to European arrival. But there are reports of it being used against Marion Dufresne, which may indicate that it is older than when he was here, which would basically make it pre-European. Remember, James Cook and Abel Tasman, along with their crews, were the only Europeans Māori had seen up until this point. Both Dufresne and Best acknowledge that the weapon was not very accurate, but could go very far. It was generally accepted in pre-European times that a person armed with a short weapon, like a patu, would usually win against someone wielding a longer one, like a taiaha or tefa-tefa. I wasn't able to find a specific reason for this, but perhaps it was because Māori combat relied on being quick and fleet of foot so someone with a short weapon would often close the gap quickly, rendering the longer weapon's advantage of reach useless and turn it into a disadvantage. 
There were some weapons that were considered particularly tapu, perhaps because it was an heirloom weapon that many great rangatira had wielded. These were treated with great respect and care, especially when the weapon was brought back from battle. If the tapu was defiled, that weapon may not be as effective, or even worse, might bring misfortune on future towa. So treating it with proper tikanga in accordance with its tapu status was very important. Over the last two episodes, you may have possibly noticed that there isn't necessarily a great variety of weapon classes that were used by Māori, mostly short clubs and long spears. Yes, there is a lot of variation within that, but broadly speaking, there wasn't too much beyond, like axes or swords. The limit on the amount of weapon types, and the fact Māori didn't have access to other weapons like bows and arrows or muskets, or just the limitation on not having access to metal and smithing, meant that warfare was kept relatively low-key, at least in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, once firearms arrived, the game absolutely changed rendering the standard Māori weaponry, which they had been using for hundreds of years, obsolete basically overnight. Next time, we will be talking about the other military innovation that rocked the Māori world. But this occurred 300 years before the Musket Wars, and came from within their culture. This saw a total change in the way Māori waged war, and even, in some respects, how they lived their day-to-day lives. We've mentioned it a few times already, but next episode, we will be diving deep into the pa. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. You can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the te reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot, and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haere tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.